Imagine you're a police officer and you're standing at the roadside and you see the, that coffin of your colleague, uh, Keith Palmer, going by on its way to its funeral. Uh, over the radio you, you hear they're asking for volunteers not to go and uh, catch those who uh, carried out the attacks or uh, put them up to the attacks in Westminster, uh, but instead to go and warn them, to plead with them and say, look, if you don't turn from what you're doing, something far worse than you can imagine will befall you. How do you feel? Do you, do you sign up? Do you volunteer for that? Well, that's two ways we could start a talk about Jonah, which is essentially a, a story of a man struggling to share the compassion that God has for his creation. He's struggling to accept that God would rather see people forgiven uh, than rushing to destructive judgment. That God's slow to anger and quick to forgiveness. And we too might share that struggle of, of Jonah. Uh, just as we would uh, struggle to go to, to Nazi Germany, just as we'd struggle to go to those who commit terrorist atrocities. If, if your response when I asked who volunteers was to think, well, actually, I'd run the other direction just like Jonah, well, then this book has a challenge for us. But, you know, I think we actually need to go deeper. Perhaps those two examples are, in some ways, easy to answer because if you're a Christian or you know much of Christian things you'll probably know the, the right answer, the correct answer uh, about the possibility of God's forgiveness even in cases of really serious or extreme evil. After all, can't we read in the Bible, God so loved the world and we can see how Jesus famously told people, well you should love your enemies. And uh, if you're aware of that story of the prodigal son where the son uh, goes away and then, then comes back. The father runs out to accept his wayward son. We know what we should say, what we should do, is to go and seek for those who don't know Jesus to turn to him and be forgiven, even in cases of terrible evil. Uh, but the book of Jonah, I think, goes beyond knowing the right answer. After all, um, if we read in chapter 4 of the book, Jonah knows the right answer. He knows what God's like, what God wants. He, he, in fact, complains to God and says, God, I knew you were gracious and compassionate. I knew you were abandoning in love. I knew you were slow to anger. I knew you turned away from causing disaster. He knew the right answer, and yet he still fled away from Nineveh. So the book of Jonah wants to go deeper, beyond that right answer on our lips, deep into our hearts, to actually ask us, well, how deep does our care, does our concern, our compassion go? Does it go as deep as God's? So what I want us to do is just to pause for a moment, to go beyond that right answer, and think personally how deep does it go. Just take a few moments in silence and ask yourself this question. What kind of person makes you rush to thoughts of anger, or mocking, or judgment, or rejection, or criticism, rather than mercy, kindness, and compassion. Let me say that again. What kind of person makes you rush to being angry and wanting judgment, rather than being merciful and wanting kindness? So perhaps instead of starting by talking about the war or, or terrorists, what if I began by saying, well, Imagine you're tasked with going to the, uh, the Brighton Humanist Association uh, to tell them about Jesus. Or to go to the meeting of that really aggressive uh, transgender rights group that says, well, a gender is just whatever we decide it to be. Our bodies don't matter at all. Or perhaps going out to speak to those who want to relax abortion laws, make it easier to get rid of babies that are unwanted. Or perhaps having to go to that proud bully at work and, and warn them that their lifestyle is going to lead to ultimate disaster. I don't know what is going on in each of your hearts. Maybe none of those people make you uh, rush to uh, judgment. But actually I know enough of my own to say that I'm pretty sure that for each of us here there will be a group of people or a particular type of person where our first reaction is anger whenever we hear about them or what they're doing or what they want. Our first thought isn't, oh, they must know Jesus, I must tell them about him. But actually, oh, I just want to get away from him. I just, just want them to be taken away from me. It's these people that we 
I don't even entertain the idea of compassion that this book is designed to challenge us about. To challenge us that God's compassion goes deeper than we can really understand and know. And actually just to show how lacking ours is. As soon as I talk about uh, people we might lack compassion for, let me confess to two uh, such groups, or at least the ones I'm willing publicly to confess to, um, for whom compassion isn't my first response. Now first there's those who are uh, too fast and too aggressive on the road, and always bullying their way along the road, always in a rush. Um, and actually, I was coming home from the prayer meeting the other night, and I was undertaken in a bus lane by someone speeding. So I was counting out their faults. There's at least three faults uh, they've done. Um, and what, what was my first thought, actually? What was my first thought? My first thought was, I really hope you get flashed by the speed camera around the corner. <laughs> now, they were doing wrong, but there was no thought of compassion. No thought of their need for Jesus. And the second group, when you could have heard them on the radio this morning or uh, any Sunday morning, they're those that uh, are on the kind of spiritual uh, section on the radio. And there'll be people of all conceivable sort of beliefs about the world, all sort of pushed together with no real recognition that actually what they say contradicts each other. Or people that will give a really edited or sort of woolly version of Jesus that it sort of suits their own agenda. I have to admit, I just don't listen to the radio on a Sunday morning anymore, unless it's just music, because I just got so angry about it. No thought, though, for me, about their eternal soul and what its fate would be. Anger, rather than concern, was my response. Rejection, judgment. Um, now, as we, I've mentioned compassion and care and concern a lot. It's important to understand what that means. Um, just before we get into the passage. It doesn't mean God says, oh, I want you to be happy, so I just forgive you and just carry on as you are with, with a bit less guilt and a bit less worries. Instead it means God relentlessly pursues people so that they can have the ultimate, the eternal joy of knowing Him. It's a care which settles for nothing but the best, which is to be forgiven and know, forgiven by and know Jesus. It is a changing compassion. But you know that saying that says, um, if you give a man a fish, then you've fed him for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, then you've fed him uh, for his whole life. It's kind of like God's compassion is it's the kind that teaches us to fish, as it were. It changes us so that we can have the best, which is knowing God. So if, if you're not a Christian here this morning, actually... It's really important that you know that God is about so much more than just removing guilty feelings and giving a, a list of rules. He cares so deeply for you. He'll go to great lengths to give you his best, which is to know him. So let's turn to uh, this first chapter of Jonah, which will um, really, if it doesn't challenge us that our compassion is lacking, I'd I haven't done a good enough job of communicating it. And bear in mind those, those groups of people that we, we thought about earlier that perhaps our first response to is, is negative. So in this first chapter we see how God brings people to worship him despite his prophet, which means his, his spokesman, his mouthpiece, being disobedient, doing the exact opposite of what he was told. The book begins in verse 1, if you've got the Bible there, take a look down there. Uh, telling us God spoke to Jonah and told him to go to Nineveh. Why was it? Verse 2. Well, it was because their wickedness had come up before him. And uh, it was as though God was sort of working through a list and, oh yes, Nineveh, the time to do something about that. He was going to send Jonah to say, enough is enough. No more will your evil be overlooked. Judgment was coming. But actually, notice two things in that verse. The first, that the city was wicked. It was a wicked city. If we take all the worst bits of a Friday or Saturday night in the city centre, the, the fighting, the sexual assaults, the drug and alcohol abuse, the people eating so much and drinking so much that they're sick, all the horrid bits of having a good time, and you add to that violence, horrid violence. I mean, in fact, that's the main thing later on, that when, as you'll know from what we did earlier, that the people repent and they turn around and they stop being violent. And Nineveh was a horrid place to be. But yet notice also God's compassion. Because we're told it's a great city. Uh, physically speaking, it was large and impressive. 
Uh, but also it was a kind of the capital city, although they wouldn't have used that kind of term, of, of this ancient Assyrian Empire. It was great, just as we might say, well, the city of London is, is great, uh, thriving and buzzing, so much culture and uh, so many people. It had such a, a wide influence. God doesn't just see the wickedness, he sees the kind of, the sheer sprawl of humanity, all its uh, creativity and all the lives lived and all the things going on, the details. That's what his compassion enables him to do. Uh, see the good and care about it, uh, and also see the bad, he doesn't ignore either. But as we see, Jonah ran away from the Lord. It's not explicit here why he did it, but it's told he, he did. Later we find actually he's afraid that God would forgive them, forgive these wicked Ninevites. In fact, he, he complains to God and says, Oh God, I knew you were like this, I knew you were forgiving, that's why I didn't want to come. Jonah flees, he doesn't want God's compassion to go to these people. He wants them to be punished, not forgiven. So he tries to run away, he gets into this boat, he travels the opposite direction, verse 3. But you see, God's purpose to have compassion isn't so easily thwarted. As uh, you might remember the spray, he sends a great wind on the sea, a great storm is whipped up. And now we come into a bit where we, I think, are meant to compare the response of the sailors and of Jonah to this storm. And, and in comparing them, actually, we'll see just how much of a failure Jonah is, how lacking his compassion is. So verse 5, the sailors are afraid, they call out to their gods, any god in fact, that might help them. They're certainly religiously confused, as you might say, and they think, well if we can just get the right god, well maybe someone will save us, anybody. But actually at least they understand that the storm is the work of a, of a divine, of a, of a godly hand. But Jonah's sleeping. He's gone down into the ship. Is he bothered about the danger? Is he calling out to his God? The captain awaits him and says, pray, pray to your God, maybe he'll save us. But you see, interesting, we're not actually told that he does get up and pray. So the storm continues, verse 7, the sailors cast lots. That was a kind of ancient way of, a bit, almost a bit like a sort of more serious version of a magic eight ball, I guess. You, you do a certain process and it tells you the answer, um, although this was thought to be the answer from God. So they, can, they carry out these locks to find out who's causing this storm, what's going on? And again, okay, they're confused, they're just crying out to anybody, but they're still seeking an answer from a God, they're still looking for something bigger. I compare that with Jonah, who's, well, just been a bit of a silent partner in the whole affair so far. But the lock man's on Jonah, it's revealed he's the reason for the storm. So verse 8, the sailors quiz him. What have you done? Who are you? And Jonah responds, he says, Well, I'm a Hebrew, I worship the God of heaven, and he made the land and the sea. So I think at this stage, the sailors must have looked at him and said, Did he really just say that? He says he worships a God who is a God of the land and the sea, but he's gotten in a boat on the sea to try and run away from this God who's God of the land and the sea. I think they must have just thought, really, is that, is that right? And it kind of exposes, doesn't it, the foolishness of what Jonah's trying to do. He's in a boat on the sea, which he knows that his God is, is ruler over. It's foolish. No wonder these sailors are, are terrified. In fact, actually, what Jonah is doing by trying to flee is denying what he speaks, what he says. He says God's king over the sea, but he thinks he can get away on a boat. He's, he's denying what he actually says about God by his actions. So yes, no wonder these sailors are terrified. In their desperation, verse 11, they think, well, what should we do? What should we do? They ask him. And he says, well, actually, you'll have to throw me overboard into the sea. And he seems to be accepting this judgment from God. But isn't this amazing? How does verse 13 start? Instead, these sailors, whose lives have been endangered by Jonah, do their best to row back to land. So, I don't know about you, but I think I probably would have tossed Jonah over the boat the second he suggested it, because, well, he's putting me in danger, so why am I going to be bothered with him? And yet, these sailors, 
who lost their cargo, they're in danger of losing their ship and their lives, they try hard to save Jonah. They have compassion. Well, at least they try, because of course God is not that easily beaten. And the wind becomes stronger, and in the end the sailors are forced to admit they must do, as Jonah suggested. So they call out to the Lord, they say, don't hold us guilty for this, this is what you seem to want. And they throw Jonah overboard and the sea becomes calm. And notice how they respond to that, verse 16, they greatly feared, or you could say they respected or honoured uh, God. They offered him a sacrifice, uh, probably uh, something to say thank you. And, and they made vows, they kind of said, well, you've saved us here God, so we'll do something. We promise to do something as a result. Well, they recognise what God's done. And uh, what's really interesting, uh, continuing this comparison, is Jonah doesn't come to the point of mentioning sacrifices and vows until much later, until he's been inside the belly of this big fish for three days. Well, let's step back then. Let's see how Jonah and these sailors stack up. The sailors are God-seekers. Yes, they're, they're confused. Yes, they're desperate. But... They're still seeking after God. And Jonah is fleeing God. The sailors risk their own lives to save Jonah. And Jonah has risked their lives because he's fleeing away from what he was commanded to do. Jonah sleeps. His actions ignore and deny the truth about God. But whereas these sailors are working, they're striving to call out to somebody. And the sailors are cautious not to end Jonah's life. Jonah seems sort of a bit resigned to his fate, I guess. But perhaps, perhaps he thinks, well, I'd rather die than see these Ninevites forgiven, so sure, throw me overboard. So remind me, who, who was it that was meant to be the prophet, the shining beacon of this compassion of God? And Jonah's failure to share in the compassionate heart of God is bruisingly shown up by actually the compassion of these sailors who, who are, are pagans, they're religiously uh, confused. What do we see then in this first chapter? Look at the beginning of the book. God tells Jonah to go and preach to this nation, not his own, a great but wicked one, but he flees. And despite Jonah's best efforts, however, by the end of the chapter, we see the confused sailors have learned about the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. They've given him worship. God's care for his creation, and humans in particular, is such uh, that he uses even the disobedience of his people uh, to show himself to people that don't know him. In other words, God will have mercy on people that don't know him, even when his own people uh, are, are being disobedient, rejecting him. And actually, this is the theme that we can see um, throughout the Bible. If you're familiar with the time of Daniel, um, God's people have been disobedient to him. They've been exiled from their land, moved to a, 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 an enemy empire. And yet, while they were there, the rule of the mightiest empire of the day was brought to worship God uh, while his people were disobedient. And in fact, while the Jewish people were hanging Jesus, the Son of God, on a cross to die, what was happening? God was making a way for people to be saved from judgment and destruction. And perhaps you'll recall there was a Roman centurion who stood by and marvelled at what was going on. What was happening? In disobedience, God was making himself known. God's compassion despite his people's disobedience. So I think this is actually a challenge to us and a comfort. Well, it challenges us because this cutting expose of Jonah's failures demonstrates God is in the business of bringing people to follow him. But we need to get on board with Yes, even when it comes to those we rush to think badly of, those people that undertake us in the bus lane and are speeding at the same time. Even those people. And God's persistent work to reveal himself to these sailors calls us, calls us, join in, challenges us not to be like Jonah. 
So if we think it's possible to be uh, Christian and not be working as much as we're able to, uh, to be making Jesus known to other people, then actually God disagrees with us. If we think it's okay to wish judgment on certain groups or not to think first compassionately, then we should be humbled by God's persistent work to bring people to know Him. Now, of course, there are situations of deep personal hurt, years of a built up anger or a kind of inherited hatred that we may need to overcome. But if we're to be like Jesus, who poured out compassion to all, even those who were killing him. We must pray to him, we must ask him to undo these hurts. Enable us both to feel that, that compassion and caring, and to be compassionate and caring. And as we've seen, that, that compassion and caring doesn't just mean um, doing nice things for people, although that's part of it. It, it will mean more, it will mean uh, bringing people to know Jesus, introducing them to him. But here, God's persistent compassion is a comfort also to us. Now, I guess when Jonah was fleeing and getting on that boat, he wasn't thinking, okay, here's my three point uh, sermon about how uh, and I'm going to give to these sailors as soon as I get on board to tell them uh, about God. Actually, we often enter situations unprepared to tell people about Jesus. We often are on a bold when the, the chance uh, comes up. And the comfort is that despite our failures, our fears, our mess-ups along the way, God will, as he wants to, still bring people to know him. Even in the midst of our failures, actually sometimes because of them. Now we need to be very clear, of course, this doesn't excuse them, doesn't encourage us to go, oh yes, let's mess up more and more because that will make God look great. No, but it does give us comfort when they occur. But of course, one of Jonah took about the sailors. But what happened to him? Well, these last saw him thrown overboard, uh, thrown into the sea. Well, verse 17, if you have a look there. The Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And he was inside the fish three days and three nights. So despite all his failures, God won't let go of him just yet. Surprise, surprise, really, isn't it? I mean, God doesn't just care for the sailors, he cares for his own people. Actually, he's determined to get someone to Nineveh to warn them so they can avoid being destroyed by turning to him. And the second is actually, and we won't necessarily see the fruit of this yet, but he wants to set Jonah on a road that will teach Jonah about God's compassion, that will help him to rejoice in it and love it. God has deep care of his own people, even when they're disobedient. Now ha having seen just how in control of the whole situation that God is, it might seem obvious to say this, but this part of the story particularly demonstrates it's foolish to try and escape God. Where will you run to? How will you hide? This is the God of the land and the sea. He will teach Jonah of his care and concern for humanity. So Christians, please see, it's foolish to try and flee from God. But when it comes to a sin, and when it comes to lacking compassion, we won't ultimately succeed in holding on to any view that limits God, uh, limits who we think God should care for. And actually, if you're not a Christian, please see that ultimately rejecting God is foolish. There'll be no sneaking by him, no carrying on rejecting him forever. Then why, why would we want to? Isn't this the kind of God that we would want? Not one who is uh, hurling down thunderbolts from the heavens, not one who is uh, giving us endless reams of, of rules to follow. One who has such a deep concern for people to enjoy life to the full by knowing him. One who doesn't give up, no matter how deep the failure. He's not quick to shut the door on you or me. But more than that, you've seen his compassion. It's not just nice thoughts or throwing us an odd tenor, so to speak, when we need it. These sailors began totally confused, but came to understand the power 
and the only true God. Jonah, although uh, we don't see it yet, is, is being taken by God on this road to understand God's compassion and enjoy it. God's compassion has got power, it's got teeth. It, it can actually give us the best, which is, of course, to know God. So how is our compassion, our care for those who don't know Jesus? Is it constant? Is it relentless? Desiring people to know full joy by knowing Him? Does it look at even the most irritating, the most hardened, the most aggressive, the most offensive, the most boundary-pushing person who is fleeing God, rejecting, hating God, and say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, use me to bring them to know you. Lord, they don't know what they're missing. Lord, they need you. 